Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 23rd of October 2016. Now this week was looking rather dull and boring until a Linux kernel exploit came to light. Now unfortunately this kernel exploit existed nine years ago and that is very very bad and very embarrassing. Now I did a more in-depth video on this but uh, we'll take a look at it. It's this uh, news article from the register. The exploit has been nicknamed Dirty Cow, the dirty copy on write. It involves a race condition within the Linux kernel and can lead to root privileges being gained. Now the main target at the moment is against web servers. So if you have a pre-existing vulnerability on a web server, for instance a SQL injection or a failure to input, sorry, carrying out input validation correctly, then it could lead to a little toehold being gained to use this copy on write exploit against a web server and gain root privileges over it. Now someone did ask, does it affect static pages? And now uh, I don't think that's actually possible if you're just serving something static from the web server. No, I don't really see how you can actually gain that little toehold into the system. There's no email born exploit as far as I'm aware. So home users don't really have anything much to worry about, although you do need to patch your system at some point is not quite as urgent as someone who is running a web server. So the flaw existed back in Linux kernel 2.6.22 from 2007. Now Linus Tovolz admitted he tried to fix the issue unsuccessfully 11 years ago. I'm not quite sure on that date there, but I think it was to do with another exploit that was happening, in that the fix for it generated this copy on write exploit. So, oops, that's a bit embarrassing there. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is not vulnerable to this exploit, but all other distros are, like Ubuntu, Debian, Arch. So it involves a race condition. So let's say, for example, you have three items that you need to carry out in a particular order. So you need to process one, and you complete that, and you start off process two, and then you complete that and start off process three, and this, those have to happen in a specific order. Don't worry exactly what they are. Say you start off process one, but before it's completed, you fork off a new process and start off process two. But if the results of process two were dependent on process one, then you've got uh, some issues here. You don't know what's going to happen. And it's how these programs handle the error, depending on what can actually happen. If they fail to handle it properly, so for this exploit, for copy on write, firstly, you have to open a root owned executable as read only and mmap it to memory as a private mapping. Meanwhile, you repeatedly call mAdvise with the mapping that mAdv don't need set, which tells the kernel you don't actually intend to use the memory. Then in another thread within the same process, you open slash proc slash self slash mem with read write access. This is a special file that allows a process to access its own virtual memory as if it was a file. Using normal seek and write operations, you then repeatedly overwrite part of your own memory that's mapped to the root owned executable. The overwrite shouldn't affect the executable on disk. So now your process has the read only binary mapped as a private read only object, one thread spamming the mAdvise on that read only object, and another thread is writing to that read only object. Writing to that memory object should trigger a copy on write. The touch page of the executable will be altered in the process's memory, not the actual underlying root owned file that it maps in. However, due to the aforementioned bug, the kernel performs the copy on write operation, but then allows the process to write the read only mapped executable anyway. These changes are committed to disk by the kernel, which is bad news. And there is an active exploit available at the moment. Ubuntu 16.10 now offers more than 500 snaps. So these snap packages provide all the dependencies for an application within a single package, should eliminate any version issues which you get with the Debian DEB packages. Among the most popular applications you can install from the Snappy store are VLC Media Player version 3, Krita 3.0.1, LibreOffice version 5.2, and KI CAD version 4.0.4. Mark Shuttleworth has announced that the next version of Ubuntu 17.04 will be named Zesty Zappus. And it marks the end of the alphabet. So what will happen in Ubuntu 17.10? Will it go back around to A or will it be a mixture of A to Z or who knows? Do you fancy going back in time and using KDE version 1? Well, now you can. 
there has been a Docker image released within KDE Neon. I'll tell you what, looking like this back in 1996 would have been quite impressive. Hell of a lot nicer than Windows 95 was. The KDE team have been planning the development cycle for next year. So their plan is to move from four to three yearly releases in 2017 and 2018. We'll be expecting Plasma 5.9 at the end of January 2017. And the next LTS release will be Plasma 5.14 in August 2018. So the Breeze icon theme will see further completion and work and refinements in the existing icon details. I tell you what, I've been a bit disappointed on some of the changes so far within the icon theme. It took some really bright colours and now have toned down the colouring, so it's a bit uh, plainer. Hmm. That's more in a Dolphin file manager, I noticed that, within some specific file types. So they also plan to tweak the breezed themed scroll bars a bit, and there will be a breeze themed Firefox theme. Oh, I'm looking forward to that one. There will be some work done on the feature backlog. One of the main things they're mentioning here is the global menu. Do you know, I remember there being an awful lot of reluctance when Ubuntu moved to a global menu style. And now they're mentioning here in KDE there was a, a lot of people after the global menu. So, well, maybe it's not all that unpopular then. Be some more work on the Plasma mobile flavour and the recently released Kirigami, which allows developers to create convergence applications that will work on both mobile and desktop form factors. There's quite a lot going on within the KDE Plasma desktop. Am I right in thinking that it's one of the most actively developed Linux desktops at the moment? There's a new live kernel patching service available in Ubuntu 16.04 for 64-bit systems. And you might be thinking, hang on, didn't we have this before with uh, KSplice? But no, this is a new service that Canonical are offering. So there's a link to a video here on how to get the live patch service. So you have to sign up on the web. Then install the canonical live patch and enable the live patch token. So the system requirements are for 64 bit systems and it works for the generic and low latency kernels. And it will work on the derivatives of Ubuntu, so you're not just confined to having Ubuntu or Ubuntu server. I don't know if this will work on Linux Mint though, because they do quite a lot of changes to the software repositories. Kids today are so stupid they fall for security scams more often than greybeards. So this was a study conducted by Microsoft, and I'm sorry I'm putting that in the week of Linux news, but hey, it's uh, tech news and I thought it'd be relevant. Tech scams take on various flavours, but often begin with a fake blue screen of death advertisement pages warning of malware infections. Those who click through or call the advertised phone numbers are often asked for remote access to their machines by operators pretending to come from tech support companies. Yeah, didn't I have something similar to that a long time ago with the Indian phone scam? <laughs> It was so funny to troll them. The scammers often run benign commands within command prompts and claim the resulting information is evidence of malware infection, which can be resolved by purchasing fake security software. Oh, of course it can. That software is often malware and the fix, in quotes, actually connects the user to a botnet. So the Microsoft study found that half of respondents aged 18 to 34 had followed the tech support scammer instructions and handed over remote access to their machines whereas only 17% of respondents aged 55 years or older took the bait. Meanwhile, about 34% of the people aged between 36 to 54 fell for the scams. So perhaps with age comes wisdom. And the Register article goes on to say, these results may at first glance appear surprising, challenging our preconceived notions that fraudsters are targeting senior citizens. So do young people just believe everything they see on the internet and uh, are old people more cynical? But of course, all of us being Linux users have absolutely no chance of falling for these scams. There have been quite a few Linux distros released this week. So we've got Solus 1.2.1, Shannon. So Solus is built from the ground up as their own Linux distro, and they use the budgie desktop environment. I did a review on it a while back, so yeah, it might be time for me to take a look at it again. Got a new release of Parted Magic. This is built more for running off a CD or a USB stick. And it's not just for the partitioning like GParted, they've also got quite a few other programs on there. So they're talking about nearly 800 programs have been updated. 
and they have an all new artwork and icon themes. There's a new budgie remix for Ubuntu, and I was quite tempted to take a look at this one. So I think it's based on Ubuntu 16.10 and comes with the budgie desktop, so it's similar to Solus have. And there's a new release of Slack L. So it's based on Slackware, and they've got three different desktops available. It's got KDE, Openbox, and Fluxbox. So it comes in two different forms, the installation disk and a live running disk. And that concludes a week of Linux news. Now thanks for watching, I'll see you all later. Thank you.